Okay, hello gamers, Monklick here, and today is actually August 21st, 2024. It is Wednesday, the day after Janthier launch, and these are the patch notes that came out with the Janthier launch yesterday. I didn't get around to reading them because I was slammed doing uh, a launch broadcast for 14 hours straight, so I'm getting to them now. So one day late, sorry about that. All right, note to user of third-party programs. I'm gonna summarize all of this. It says your crap's probably broken, especially if it was Arc TPS. Now that's actually since been fixed, but you'll need to update them. If you used an overlay like Blishhood, it should be fine. Guild Wars 2 Janthir Wilds. While the commander fought back against the treacherous Midnight King in the Realm of Dreams, the threat of the Cryptus didn't go unnoticed by the rest of Tyria. Their villages and cities were attacked and countless lives were lost, and yet the world had no idea where their assailants originated from. Just as the commander emerges from the journey into the Secrets of the Obscure, some of Tyria's most pivotal world leaders have formed the Tyrian Alliance, an organization that seeks global collaboration in the healing years following the end of the Dragon Cycle. Being a figure of hope to those who've helped throughout time, the commander must navigate the delicate tides of international affairs while also being enlisted to help keep an eye on other enigmatic developments. Without spoiling anything, I will not spoil in this video, uh, it was great. As someone who, like, I'm not like a lore junkie, I'm not like the wooden potato, I'm just like the spongy potato, uh, I loved that thing. There was characters from every expansion, every living world, and even the books in that delegation. It was, it was a lore bonanza. All right, moving on. When the first mission is to venture into the dangerous stretches of Janthir to befriend a long-sequestered society of Coden, the path forward seems clear. That clarity will be quickly challenged when the lowland Coden begins, uh, begin whispering of strangers and abnormal events arising throughout their deltas. How long can the commander maintain the state of respite before it is lost? How will the Astral Ward react to global developments as their existence becomes harder to conceal? The commander must walk a fine line between diplomacy and action as they make allies with the Lowlanders and uncover the bloodied history of the Isles of Janthir. Storm clouds thicken by the hour. Homesteads. Players can now obtain their own personal homestead by playing through Guild Wars 2 Janthir Wild storyline. Homesteads are an account-wide personal housing uh, instance that provides you with an area of land and a permanent structure to cultivate, decorate, and share with your friends. Players with a homestead can place a conjured doorway and open world maps, which they can use to bring their party into their homestead. All resource nodes and cats unlocked from home instances will be available in the homestead. A new account-wide handiworker or crafting discipline is available, allowing players to craft decorations for their homestead. Uh, it is account-wide and leveled through the mastery system. You do not have to level it like normal crafting professions. Every time you level the mastery, it gains another 100 or so levels until it's at 500, which is at maximum. Unlocked mounts will appear in the homestead. Characters that were logged out while inside the homestead instance will visit the homestead as NPCs. Example, if you have a revenant and they're logged out in the homestead and then you log on to your warrior and go into the homestead, you might see the revenant standing there like he's an NPC uh, or she, and then you can interact with them. Land spears. I hate that we call them that. All professions can now use spears on land. This is unlocked via a world v world vendor purchase or by playing the first few chapters of the Guild Wars 2 Janthir story. I actually did not know it was available from a World v. World vendor purchase. Uh, that would have been useful to know uh, a few minutes ago when I made a video on how to get the spears. <laughs> New masteries. Homesteading. Once a homestead has been obtained, you will begin to master the crafting of homestead decorations without the need for a crafting discipline. As the mastery grows, your access to recipes and space to work it will increase, and you will gain bonuses within your homestead, such as rested experience and automated gathering of resources. Lowland Coden. As you meet the Lowland Coden in the Janthir region, you will gain access to their techniques, such as learning to use the spear on dry land, gaining power from local honey, and harvesting resources more efficiently. Warclaw. If you've not yet bonded with a Warclaw, Janthir Wilds will make doing so easier and allow you to use its skills outside world versus world. Uh, as you progress your Warclaw mastery, it will become immune to falling damage, leap further into the air, and gain enhanced stamina and regeneration, which is shared across all your mounts. Uh, so for anyone who never had a Warclaw before, maybe you never did World v. World, uh, the one key on it is just a pounce, and then it dismounts you, just like most animals. Uh, the two is a sniff. It will mark enemies. You see the yellow dots down here, as well as treasure chests that are nearby on the map. Three is a chain pull and a CC. In some parts of the expansion, you use it to, like, you know, pull on things. Uh, the four is a uh, ranged damaging attack, and the five is just your dodge. Um, as far as the masteries of the Warclaw, they are as mentioned, so I, I won't go into those. Um, 
and that's where we were. Okay, decorating in general. A new hotkey has been added for entering and exiting decoration mode, and specialized skills are available while in decorating mode. You can change which set of these is displayed using the three sub-mode buttons above your skill bar, place new decorations, modify existing decorations, and erase decorations. So those are above your far uh, above your bar where the F1, F2, and F3 keys usually are, uh, your class mechanic, things like that, when you are in your home instance after you have entered decoration mode. So when you go into the home instance, there's a decorating button near the top right. I believe it's L by default. Uh, and then once you're in decoration mode, F1, F2, F3 is place new item, modify existing item, or erase an item. Uh, to place new decorations, you begin placement by choosing a location on the ground to put the decoration or by enabling the manipulator skills for more control over how the decoration is placed. Um, I'm going to skim this section because that we went over a whole video very recently where we went over this in detail. And this, it's really hard to process this without trying it yourself. But essentially, uh, you go into decoration mode by clicking in the top right on the decorate button. F1 is new item. F2 is tweak an item that's already on the ground. Like if you want to delete the grass your home instance starts with, you go to modify uh, or erase decorations and then interact with it and then you can delete it. Uh, and your one through five keys like turn the thing or change the scale of the item and things like that. Um, so we're going to skim over all of that. All right. So decorating in guild halls has been updated with the Janthier Wilds decorating capabilities. The size and shape of interaction boundaries on interactable decorations has been changed. A slight rotation change of up to a degree may be noticeable in the placement of some large guild hall decorations. The Cornyn Brazier guild hall decoration now correctly has a flame. Oops. Attempting to place a decoration in an invalid location will now highlight the decoration in red. Previously, this functionality only worked in the Guild at Hollow Guild Hall. Entering decoration mode while in the Guild Arena will now allow direct placement of arena decorations without needing to interact with the Arena Obstacles Coordinator. Wizard's Vault. The Wizard's Vault inventory has been updated for the new season. Last season's unique rewards are now available in the Legacy tab. This new season, unique rewards now require Guild Wars 2 Janther Wilds ownership to purchase. Legacy rewards will continue to require their associated expansion. So if a legacy item was from Secrets of the Obscure, you'd have to have Soto in order to get it. Uh, objective updates. New special objectives for the season have been added, and more will appear over the course of the, of the season, including special objectives associated with bonus events and festivals. New daily and weekly objectives have been added for adventuring in the Janther region, as well as Guild Wars 2 Soto release Midnight King. Uh, and while we're talking about the Wizard's Vault, uh, I know some people will ask, the new Legendary Starter Kit, which is the fifth one that they've had, has the Juggernaut, Incinerator, Twilight, and Kamahawakawakawaka, which is the Gen 1 Spear. Uh, Twilight and the Gen 1 Spear, I think, are the, the big items that people might be jumping for in that, for those who are interested. Um... A new special objectives for the season has been added, and more will appear. We've just read that. Inventory updates. A new item type in the Wizard's Vault this season, the Falling Star Quest License, invites player on a short adventure in the newly available Janthir region. Your efforts will be rewarded with an Ascended Spear and Gloves, as well as a series of achievements to track the quest progress. Uh, I can show that in game since we are doing this one day late. How lucky for you guys. Uh, the Falling Star Quest License is this sucker right here. And if we go to the eye to preview it, we have got these gloves. And this is what they look like. It's like a small glove on the left hand and a big gauntlet on the right hand. And we also have the spear itself, which is right here. And the spear, I've been told, has an interaction with the glove that looks like an infusion. Although I cannot uh, showcase that during the preview window, it appears. Back to this. Uh, Legendary Starter Kit number five is now available, which I just showed a second ago, so no need to go, no need to go further into that. All right. General. Cats in the home instance can now be petted unless they're otherwise occupied. Very important stuff. Cats and other pets associated with 2023 Extra Life Charity donation incentives have appeared across Tyria. They are visible only while under the effects of the Chatoyant Elixir or Chatoyant Lens. Uh, that's from like the April Fool's things where you see giant cats around the world and stuff like that. Uh, more animals can be petted. Uh, animals from 2023 donations are present in Corteria now, as well as the Lowland Shore map of Janther. Scribe crafting stations now have unique background art rather than reusing the art from weaponsmith crafting stations. That was always kind of odd. The tools of the Luxon Hunters and energized tools of the Luxon Hunters collection have been moved to the rare collections category. Fixed an issue that caused progress in the tools of the Luxon Hunters collection to stall if a player unlocked a prerequisite weapon skin without owning End of Dragons. Visiting Alliance Arch will reset the progress. So if sublime. you, it is sublime. If you have that problem, go visit Lion's Arch and that'll fix you right up. 
uh, fixed an issue that allowed the Delve of the Haze achievement uh, category to be viewed and accessed by players who do not own Guild Wars 2 End of Dragons. How dare you look upon that? You are not worthy to gaze upon it. Updated the damage types of Gen 3 Legendary Weapon variants. Krokotork is now Lightning, Primordis is now Fire, and Jormag is now Ice. Um... I actually don't fully understand what that means, because we don't have, like, fire resistance in this game, or ice resistance, so I don't know. Maybe that just makes the changes, like, the special effects slightly, or how it looks when they impact. I'm not sure. Uh, let me know if you know. Uh, it's for death animations. Okay, well, there you go. Several updates have been made to the currency and materials exchange vendor Gar Leadclaw. Adjusted the currency cost of the Essences Exchange tab. Updated the variety of items to exchange for weekly astral fluctuating masses. Updated the variety of items to exchange for Heart of Maguma bulk exchanges and Crystal Desert bulk exchanges tabs. Adjusted the cost of those items, the players' exchanges for currencies or materials. Gar now appears in several new locations. No masteries are required for players to see him or use his services in these areas. Dragon Stand, east of the packed base camp waypoint, offering Heart of Maguma bulk exchanges. I have the North near Snargle Gold Claw, offering Crystal Desert bulk exchanges and two new daily exchanges, and Arborstone near Kestrel Zuru, offering Cantha bulk exchanges and five new daily ones. World Polish fixed an issue that caused Cryptus Rifts to spawn too closely in certain areas of Thunderhead Peaks. The beach resort at South Sun Cove will no longer automatically transform players into an armorless state. For guests wishing to take a swim, a nearby tent has been repurposed as a changing area. Uh, Skywatch Archipelago fixed an issue that prevented Shrine Guardian chest uh, numbers from being properly tracked for progress in the Rise and Shine achievement. Fixed an issue that prevented the Water Bucket near Aid Fort Salma Renowned Heart from being accessible. Uh, Den of Iniquity, indeed. Relics. Guild Wars 2 Jan Thier Wilds relics will need to be unlocked before they are selectable options for the Legendary Relic. They were very clear about this when the Legendary Relic came out. They said the Legendary Relic, when it first came out, would have every relic in the game. But in the future, you will need to unlock any new relic at least one time, and then it will be added to your relic as an option from that point forward to be used at your leisure. Uh, so, the six new ones. Relic of the Claw. When you disable an enemy, you gain a strike damage bonus for a duration. Relic of the Sorrow. After using an elite skill, you create an area that destroys missiles and heals and reduces incoming damage for allies. Relic of the Blightbringer builds stacks when inflicting poison on an enemy at five stacks. The next time you inflict poison will do many poisons, weakness, and cripple on nearby foes. Uh, Relic of the Stormsinger. After using a movement skill, your next attack performs a chain lightning strike. Relic of Atrocity. Your lifesteal damage and lifesteal healing is increased. And Relic of Rivers. Gain alacrity and regen when you dodge. This is insane because I think the current version of this has no internal cooldown. I kind of hope they leave it alone in open world, because, you know, who cares if someone has some busted build in open world? But I feel like that if it hasn't already, it's go by the time this video gets out, that it's going to be uh, locked down pretty hard in things like World v. World and stuff like that. Because uh, this is crazy. Uh, world v. World. The Warclaw has received updates to its skills with the release of Janther Wilds. Sniff will now identify damaged and destroyed gates and walls for players. Uh, chain pull can now also be attached to walls and will apply weakened frame, an effect similar to structural vulnerability. That is a big change that people need to be aware of. You can now use the chain pull on walls. Lance now has two charges. Additionally, the Warclaw will now be unlocked for anyone who enters World v. World if they own Path of Fire or Heart of Thorns. Players who have previously completed the Warclaw war the Warlock, the Warclaw collection to unlock the mount will receive a War Machine weapon skin and its 250 skirmish claim tickets in their mail upon logging in. The increased stamina and Warclaw's blessing have been removed from the Warclaw mastery ability line and are now inherent benefits to owning the Warclaw in World v. World. Finally, the World v. World ability cost to fill out the Warclaw mastery line have been greatly reduced. So much easier to get the war the war claw skill uh if you've never done world v world and you've been thinking about it uh, some of the first things you would usually want to get in there is auto loot because uh, your auto loot outside is not the same as auto loot inside world v world and the war claw things and by making it cheaper to get the war claw things you're gonna have a whole lot of, of spare points that you can spend on other stuff and get that stuff unlocked faster okay profession skills elementalist Increased etching durations from 5 seconds to 7. This is their Spear 5 that makes the giant pretty rune on the ground. Etching skills now put their corresponding lesser skill on a short cooldown to prevent unintentional usage. Uh, the visual effects of Jockelhop, Derrico, and Haboob will no longer be replaced by legendary effects. 
The beneficial effects by Seethe and Energize will no longer be consumed by slot 1 skills. Flame Spear now strikes up to 3 enemies. Blazing Barrage, they've increased the damage slightly in PvE and PvP. Volcano increased the damage slightly in PvE. Ice Beam increased the damage uh, power coefficient from 0.33 to 0.4 in World v. World and 0.33 to 0.45 in PvP. Ripple, the skill is now ground targeted and also heals the user in addition to its other effects. Fixed an issue that caused Ripple's movement speed to be affected by quickness, slow, and movement speed modifiers. Undertow, the skill now always pulls enemies that it strikes and will slow enemies within the inner radius. Fulgore skill now strikes enemies in addition to the damage over time effect. Fixed an issue that allowed Fulgore's damage over time effect to be applied to world v. world walls. Reduce the damage over time effect from 3 seconds to 1 second in PvE. Derrico increased the power coefficient from 4 to 5 in PvE and 1.4 to 1.6 in World the World. Earthen Spear now pierces. Increased power coefficient slightly in PvE and PvP. Harden increased the day's duration uh, from 0 0.25 seconds to 2 seconds. That's an 8 times increase in PvE. Fissure increased power coefficient slightly in all game modes. Haboob increased the power coefficient from 3.5 to 4.25 in PvE and slightly in World v. World. Fixed issues that prevented several skills from being affected by skill retargeting. Fixed an issue that caused multiple volcano or lesser volcano skills cast in short succession to be affected by each other's damage falloff. Fixed an issue that prevented the flipped version of spear slot 5 skills from being available when swapping out of a devil attuned state as a weaver. All right. Uh, engineer. Puncturing jab. So now we're talking about the NG spear. Increase the angle of the skill's hitbox. Same for rending strike. Amplifying slice. Same thing. Also, reduce the casting time by 0.2 seconds. Reduce the bleeding and vuln durations from 8 to 6 seconds. Increase bleeding and vuln stacks from 1 to, one to 2. Conduit surge. Increase visual effects to help engineers identify focused targets. Updating this skill so that focus can only hit one target at a time. Successfully applied focus now applies a focusing effect to the engineer to help indicate time left on the focus target. Increase the burning stacks from 2 to 3 in PvE and 1 to 2 in other game modes. Reduce the focus burning duration from 8 to 6 seconds and the unfocused burning duration from 6 to 4 seconds in PvE. Reduce the cooldown from 8 to 6 seconds in other game modes. Lightning Rod, increase strike damage per hit on focused targets from 0.25 to 0.3. Increase the strength damage per hit on unfocused targets a tiny bit. Electric Artillery, increase the casting time by 0.24 seconds. Increase the range from 600 to 900. Substantial. This skill no longer requires you to face your target. Also, awesome, increase the burning duration from 4 to 6 seconds in PvP and World v. World. Devastator, which also that makes me think of the Decepticon. Reduce the casting time and aftercast by 0.25 seconds. Increase the range from 450 to 600. Increase the damage coefficient from 1.75 to 2. Increase the burning duration from 4 to 6 seconds in PvP and World v. World. Boiling Point, it reduced the internal cooldown from 3 seconds to 1. Modified Ammo, reduce the damage per condition from 2% to 1.5 in World v. World. Hollow Smith. Uh, Photon Blitz increase the total damage coefficient uh, a little bit in PvP and World v. World. Prime Light Beam reduce the field's number of targets from 5 to 3 in World v. World. Uh, Laser's Edge reduce the maximum damage bonus from 15% to 10% in World v. World. Guardian Permeating Wrath reduce the number of targets from 5 to 3 in World v. World. Daybreaking Slash now heals the player as well as other allies. Increase the base healing multiplier from 0.03 to 0.06. Increase the healing power multiplier from... The, it's the same. Increase the target cap to 5 for both allies and enemies. Helio Rush is now a targeted area of effect skill and will heal the player as well as other allies. Increase the movement speed by 15%. Reduce the power multiplier from 1.25 to 0.8 in PvP and World v. World. The illuminated version of this skill now additionally deals bonus damage to enemies and inflicts weakness upon them. Gleaming Disc, the non-illuminated version of this skill now has a visual effect. The illuminated version of this skill now does more damage to play enemies on the follow-up shockwave. Solar Storm, the illuminated version of this skill, now has a higher limit on the number of strengths per target and additionally heals for each condition removed from allies. Reduce the power multiplier from 2 to 1.8 in PvE. 
Symbol of Luminance, resistance granted by the skill can now stack with other sources of resistance, but the symbol can only grant resistance once per interval to each affected target. Whew. Dragon Hunter. Dragon's Maw increased the cooldown from 40 seconds to 60 in PvP. Honestly, it was pretty insane that it was only 40 second cooldown before. Test of Faith, the skill's pass-through strike now deals additional damage to disabled targets. Reduce the pass-through damage coefficient from 2.5 to 1.88 in PvP. Procession of Blades, reduce the total damage coefficient from 4.4 to 3.6 in PvP. Mesmer, Mind of the Gap, the skill's visual effect has been improved to better outline the outer edge. And it, lo it looks really good. I tried this out. It looks very nice. It's much easier to see where that big damage is going to be. The skill now always grants clarity on hit. The skill's outer edge will now always deal critical damage when it strikes an enemy. Increase the damage coefficient from 1.4 to 1.54 PvP. Imaginary Inversion. The skill will now cleanse conditions at the start of the cast, regardless of whether you have clarity. This skill no longer requires hitting an enemy to heal, and the healing is now increased by clarity. That'll make it uh, feel much better as a, you know, trying to get yourself out of a bad situation button. Phantasmal Lancer, the skill's phantasms no longer dash at the target and now launch their spears at the target, inflicting damage in an area. The skill now grants swiftness to the player, increase the damage from 0.4 to 0.6 in World v. World and PvP. That'll make those a little bit more reliable at landing their damage, because in PvP and World v. World, your target is always moving, if they can, unless they're immobilized or something. So the dash would just often whiff, so the fact that they try to throw it, it makes it a little bit more reliable on possibly landing. Mirage. Fractured Glass. Increase the damage per hit from 0 0.25 to 0 0.3125. I can't believe I haven't read that, read that out loud. World v. World and PvP. Phantom Razor now inflicts Crippled for 1.5 seconds instead of dazing the target. Mirage Mantle fixed an issue that prevented sharp edges from stacking duration properly. Necromancer. Soul Shard damage and healing information is now visible when viewing the Perforate tooltip. That was... Very frustrating during the beta that we weren't able to see that. I'm glad for that. Soul Shard duration now refreshes when gaining new shards. That was another thing that was kind of troublesome. If you were um, even just autoing, which was one of the fastest ways to stockpile shards, you could not always keep up max shards because the oldest one kept falling off when you put you know put like the newest one up. Kind of like uh, stacks of might, but they were harder to obtain. Deadly Slice, the skill now grants one Soul Shard if it strikes an enemy. Perforate, increase the power coefficient a little bit. Isolate, increase power coefficient from 1.8 to 2.4 in PvE. Uh, Addle, reduce the number of soul shards required to inflict immobilize from 4 to 3. The skill now always grants its bonus effects when striking a defiant enemy. Increase the base number of soul shards generated from 1 to 2 and increase the power coefficient from 1.5 to 1.9 in PvE. Addle, let's see, for Necromancer, Addle, they reduce the number of soul shards required to inflict immobilize from 4 to 3. The skill now always grants its bonus effects when striking a defiant enemy. Uh, and of course, defiant enemies, again, are any enemies that are basically like a boss. You know, an enemy that you can't stun when you press the stun button. Uh, have a great stream, man. We watched your Lonely Tower Guide. Oh, goodness. That is a rough fractal. I, I hope it helped. I hope it helped you out. Uh, let's see. Uh, da, da, da. Increase the number of soul shards generated from 1 to 2 and increase the power coefficient from 1.5 to 1.9 in PvE. Okay. Uh, extirpate. This skill now grants 12% life force and 5 might upon striking the first enemy and 2% life force and 1 might for each additional enemy struck. Increase the power coefficient from 3.4 to 3.8 in PvE only. Signet of Vampirism. Reduce the casting time by 0.4 seconds. Uh, Vile Blast. Reduce, uh, see, increase the cooldown by 3 seconds of PvP. And Dread. Reduce the internal cooldown from 3 seconds to 1 second. Let's see. Okay, so that was it for the Necromancer changes. Uh, or I should say core Necro changes. Reaper. Suffer. They've increased the cooldown by 4 seconds. So it's going from 16 to 20 in PvP. Nothing can save you. Reduce the duration of unblockable stacks from 10 seconds to 6 in all game modes and increase the cooldown from 16 to 24 seconds in PvP. All right. Ranger. Drake Swipe. Increased power coefficient. Uh, barely in PvE only. Um, I don't know if this is like for Drakes or for Soul Beast merged with a Drake, but there it is. Um, Beasting, increase the power coefficient from 0.7 to 1.2. All right, so I'm just going to summarize this to save all our time. All of the stuff related to the Ranger Spear, they were like, wow, this really sucks. The damage is really bad in PvE. We're going to buff the damage. And they did, 
And as someone who has been playing exclusively Ranger since the launch of Janthier and playing with the Spear, it is better. I don't think in PvE it's going to replace any weapons yet. Because, like, when I did testing, I was able to get, like, these numbers with Sword and Axe, these numbers with Hammer, and these numbers with Spear. Uh, spear was like 2k below the below the hammer and it feels kind of clunky to use because like you constantly go into stealth to trigger an ambush and when you go into stealth you turn your attack off so it's like you spend Kokushi a few seconds Kokushi not gifted a tier one sub to azure forth, underscore forth, echo so they upped the damage of everything related to spears uh for the ranger then they improved the tracking of the three skill which is when you throw the spear owl's flight they reduced the casting time of the follow-up attack of wolf's onslaught that's when you go invisible and then use the two key uh, Panther's Prowl was the 5 where you go stealth. Uh, now, if you use the 5 and get revealed imid immediately, you still can ambush for a few seconds after that. Uh, additionally, if you use the 5, it does not uh, require an additional charge of the 5 to throw the net, which is the flip over skill of the 5, the spider web. All right, the pet selection panel now displays more pets per row. Uh, just because I'm on my ranger, I can actually show that. There it is. Okay. The flourish reduced the power coefficient from 0.75, 1.0 to 0.6.9 in PvP. That is mace 2. Thistle Guard, mace 4, increased cooldown uh, from 20 seconds to 24 in PvP. Wild Strike, such as mace 5, reduced the total damage from 2.4 to copper. And reduced the day's duration from 1.5 seconds to 1 in PvP. Healing Spring reduced the duration of regen per pulse from 3 seconds to 1.5 in PvP. No! Healing Spring, my love! Uh, Smoke Cloud, Juvenile Smoke Scale, increased the cooldown from 20 seconds to 30 in PvP. And stock on Juvenile Jaguar. This skill will no longer apply stealth to downed players. Increase the duration from 35 seconds to 45 in PvP. Moment of Clarity. Reduce the days and stun duration. Increase from 50% to, to 10 in PvP or World v. World. So, uh, basically, a lot of the things for Ranger in, in uh, PvP that were fun or useful have been nerfed. <laughs> I haven't PvP'd in a while. I need to try it and see how bad it is. Untamed, Ravager's Abandon, uh, which I, was that the Spear Ambush? I think that was the Spear Ambush. Uh, reduce the power coefficient from 1.25 to 1.06, blah, blah, in PvP. Rampant Growth, reduce the power coefficient from 0.91 to 0.75 PvP. Relentless Whirl, reduce the total power coefficient from 1.7 to 1.5. And Enhancing Impact, reduce the quickness duration from 3 seconds to 1.5. So, a lot of the stuff involving Untamed Ambush skills have been nerfed in PvP. Revenant. The first spear skill slots melee and ranged auto attacks have been separated to give each its own tooltip. Each attack now inflicts one vuln for six seconds in addition to torment. Abyssal fire, the skill's casting time has been slightly reduced. The skill now attacks up to three targets in a radius of 180 upon striking a foe. This attack is a 20% projectile finisher. Abyssal strike, this casting time has been reduced from nearly one second to slightly over 2.5 seconds. Increase the attack radius to match other melee skills. Abyssal Force reduced the energy cost from 5 to 4, reduced the casting time to 0.5 seconds. The skill now inflicts one stack of burning for 8 seconds instead of inflicting torment. Abyssal Blitz now drops a maximum of 3 mines, and the distance at which they are created has been slightly increased. Blitz mines now inflict weakness in addition to slow and chill effects. Abyssal Blot now pulls enemies on its first damage pulse instead of its last. Each pulse now inflicts poison for 6 seconds. Abyssal Raise, the casting time of this skill has been reduced from 1.25 seconds to 0.75 seconds. The skill now inflicts Torment without requiring Crushing Abyss, and it inflicts two st uh, stacks of Torment per stack of Crushing Abyss. Increase the bonus strike damage per stack of Crushing Abyss from 20% to 33% in PvE, and 10% to 17% in PvP and World v. World. Reduce the energy cost of the skill from 10 to 8. Crushing Abyss, they reduce the maximum stacks from 5 to 3. Coalescence of Ruin reduced the power coefficient slightly in PvP. Phase Smash increased cooldown from 12 to 15 seconds of PvP. And Field of the Mist reduced the field duration from 6 to 3 in PvP World v. World. Okay, I have not played Revenant since Janthe released. I heard terrible, terrible things about the Revenant Spear during the beta. It was really slow. It was clunky. The damage sucked. It was like a foam pool noodle, etc., etc. I have been hearing good things about it from my community since Janthier launched. I understand that it is in a much better position now. I just have not tried it firsthand. So that's just what I've heard. Uh, okay. Renegade. Orders from above. They reduce the alacrity duration per pulse from 1.5 seconds to 0.75 seconds of World v. World. So once again, nerfing the uptime of alacrity in World v. World and PvP game modes. 
Vindicator. Axion's Trust. It reduced the energy granted from 25 to 10 in PvP. Death Drop. Reduced power coefficient from 1.3 to 0.75 in PvP. And Empire Divided. Reduced the power bonus from 240 to 120 uh, in PvP. Thief. Uh, no one cares. Let's keep going. Um, uh, th th That's fine. No, okay. All right. All right. All right. Using a lead attack skill will now always enable follow-up skills unless the skill is interrupted. Okay, so this is a reference to the spear system for Thief. Uh, the Thief essentially has, like, multiple weapon chains. So if they use, like, the 2 skill, the 2 and the 3 both flip over. So, like, the 2 has a 1, 2, 3, and the 3 has a 1, 2, 3. So you can use, like, your 2 and then your 3 and then your 2 again, or 2, 3, 3, or 3, 2, 2, or 3, 3, 3. So you can kind of uh, build a bear workshop with your auto attack chain. Using a lead attack will now always enable follow-up skills unless the skill is interrupted. Using a follow-up skill will now always enable the finisher skills unless the skill is interrupted. So let's uh, imagine you're chasing someone and you're planning to go 2, 3, 2. But you hit 2 and it doesn't connect because they were out of range, so it doesn't flip over. So when you hit 3, it's actually the first 3 instead of the second 3. That was the problem they had before. So now it will always flip over even if you whiff the attack. Mantis Sting reduced the bleeding uh, from stack from two stacks for six seconds to one stack for four seconds in PvE. Unsuspecting Strike fixed an issue that caused this skill to be affected by movement speed. Entangling Asp reduced the poison stacks from two for six seconds to one for two seconds of PvE. Dad Asp. Falling Spider reduced, uh, sorry, increased the number of targets struck from three to five. Reduced the bleeding and poison stacks from two for seven seconds to one for three and a half seconds in PvE only. Shattering Assault increased the number of targets from 3 to 5. Ashen Assault, Malicious Ashen Assault increased the attack range from 170 to 240. Reduced the Bleeding and Poison stacks from 4 to 8 seconds to 3 for 7 seconds in PvE. Fixed an issue that prevented some Spear skills from generating Shadow Force. Tactical Strike reduced the power coefficient from 1.3 to 1.1 in PvP. And Infiltrator's Return increased initiative cost from 2 to 3 in PvP only. Deadeye. Mercy increased the cooldown from 30 seconds to 45 in PvP. Malicious Tactical Strike reduced the damage coefficient from 1.33 to 1.1 in PvP. And final class, Warrior. Mighty Throw. The skill now produces Spear Shards regardless of range. The initial Spear Projectile deals more damage and the follow-up Shard Projectiles deal less damage. The skill now counts as an Explosion. Maiming Spear reduced the casting time by approximately 15%. Increased the Aftershock damage coefficient from 0.6 to 1.2 in PvE. The Aftershock now occurs in a radius of 240 regardless of range. It deals bonus damage to the enemy closest to the epicenter and counts as an explosion. Disrupting Throw has been moved to the third slot. This skill now immobilizes at all ranges. The skill additionally dazes the first target struck by the projectile. Reduce the total casting time by 33%. It decreased the cooldown from 15 to 10 seconds. Spear Marshal Support has been moved to the fourth slot. Reduce the damage multiplier from 0.7 to 0.6 in PvE. This target now takes increased damage from the skill. Spears now spawn over the target without a delay, regardless of its distance from the player. Increase the radius from 90 to 120. Decrease the cooldown from 20 to 15 seconds. Um, spear Marshal Support was kind of funny, because like it looked like that you, you threw spears in the air, and then they rained down on the target. The problem was the rain was so bad that if the target was just running in a straight line, the spears always missed. They landed behind you, and it was the easiest thing in the world to avoid. So that's what they were working on there. Spear Swipe, the skill has been moved to the fifth slot. Players can now move freely while casting the skill. The p movement portion of the skill now occurs at the same time that the projectile fires. Increase the power coefficient from 1.5 to 2.0 in PvE. The skill's projectile is now unblockable, reflects missiles, and is a projectile finisher. Oh my gosh, can I get fries with that? The first enemy struck by the skill's projectile is launched instead of knocked back. Increase the evasion duration from 0.5 to 0.75 seconds. Increase the cooldown from 10 to 20. This cooldown is decreased if an attack is evaded or at least one enemy was struck by the projectile. Harrier's Toss reduced the casting time by approximately 33%. This does not affect the evade duration. Players leap higher and can now move freely while casting the skill. The skill now does more damage to the target closest to its epicenter. Wild Throw reduced the total casting time from 2.5 to 2 seconds. The total number of spears the thrown remains the same. The skill now deals more damage to the first enemy it hits. The skill is now a projectile finisher and can no longer be used on targets behind you. 
Uh, Path to Victory no longer inflicts weakness. Reduce the damage coefficient from 0.91 to 0.5 in PvP. Snap Pull increase the cooldown from 18 to 22 seconds in PvP. So we're talking about staff now. Impale reduce the damage coefficient from 1.5 to 1.2 in PvP. Uh, let's see. Gem Store Improvements. The following changes have been made to categories and tabs in the gem store to aid in ser item searchability and fix an issue that caused text to overlap under certain circumstances. Toys tab is now called Novelties. Mount category and skiff skins category have been merged into Mounts and Skiffs category under Style. The Jade Bot skins category, Emotes category, and Fishing Rod skins category have been merged into the Miscellaneous category under Style. Bug fixes. Um, fi okay, so... These issues, all the following issues that I just highlighted, if I talk about them, it could potentially give spoilers from Janther, which is not the goal of this recording. So I am just going to skim past that. As always, there is a link to the patch notes below the video that I will include. Um, posted the next day, lucky for you, I'm doing this a day late, they did some bug fixes. They fixed several server crashes, fixed an issue that caused the game to crash when automatically converting certain currencies, such as the coins, the like unusual coins, fixed an issue that caused Soto vendor to request unusual coins instead of ancient coins. Um, on day one, Lear was asking for the wrong type of coins, so certain people got hit by a wall when they were trying to work on uh, obsidian legendary armor. Fixed an issue that prevented some players from seeing conduits summoned by the world boss. There is a boss that summons a thing called a conduit, and if you can't see it, that's bad. Fixed an issue that caused some players' handiwork or crafting discipline to be immediately set to 500. Present. That happened to me. Um, the way it's supposed to work is as you unlock the handiwork or masteries, your skill just jumps like 100, 200, etc. And mine was like 500 right out the gate. Um, now, fortunately for them, I did not go on a rampage making sofas and selling them. That wasn't what I was, you know, what I cared about. Uh, updated the handiworker crafting level of all players to the appropriate level based on your unlocked homesteading mastery tier, which is how it's supposed to work. Uh, fixed an issue that prevented adventures in the Janthia region from awarding XP on completion. Fixed an issue that caused Guild Wars 2 Soto exploration to continue awarding unusual coins. Uh, fixed an issue that prevented new rifts from spawning properly. Reduced the Ursus Oblige cost of collection items for the Falling Star Crafting List achievement. Uh, really quick, there I, I'm going to be super vague on this. There's one step of the story that tells you to check if there's any rifts in the area, and you got to pull out the Heart of the Obscure and scan for a rift, like you did in Soto a million times, but you're doing it in Janthir. If it doesn't work for you, by the time you see this video, you can get around that by doing a Tier 2 rift. You use a motivation and do it, or just join a group in LFG and do it. Hopefully, it's fixed by the time you see this video, but if not, that's the current workaround. All right. Uh, reduce the Ursus Oblige cost of collection items for the Falling Star Crafting List achievement. Um, and that is it. Whew. All right. That is everything that we currently know about all of the changes that were released since uh, Guild Wars 2 Janthier Wilds came out. As always, if you've got any questions, problems, thoughts, concerns, or you want additional details on any of this, I will link the notes down below so you can see them yourself, or uh, we can just fight in the comment section. Either one.